coming up on the Louis Diaz podcast. To do the things that make you happy because we only have one life and I would not want to be stuck at home doing something that I don't love just for a paycheck, but rather to live a life that I love where I feel happiness like each day and just yeah, do the things that I want to do. Hi, and welcome to the Louis Diaz podcast, the podcast where you'll meet some of the most fascinating and incredible people from all walks of life. And together, we're inviting you in to be our special guest as we take you through some of their amazing experiences, adventures, and journeys. So sit back, and I hope you enjoy this episode of the Louis Diaz podcast. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Louis Diaz podcast. Today, I've actually got someone I'm super excited to introduce to you all. His name is Nicholas Glued. He's from Denmark. He's a traveler, adventurer, a landscape photographer, just an all-round legend. Someone that I've come to know a little bit actually through someone that I've interviewed on the podcast a couple of times, Andrew Dean. He's mentioned you, Nicholas, as someone who's been really instrumental in his photography journey Mm. and also been there with him through some of his adventures and it feels so surreal like I feel like you and I have like I know you but this is the first time we're meeting yeah I I feel the same way so um yeah just to to introduce myself a bit my name is Nicholas I'm from Denmark 29 years old just a pretty normal guy I have my day job back in Denmark which I kind of love I'm a teacher but um like my real passion is as you mentioned photography it's traveling it's creating memories, creating stories, and just meeting nice people. Yeah. You know what's funny there, Nick, is you describe yourself as just this pretty normal guy. And I've gone through your photos, you know, on Instagram. I'm going through your blog as well. And I think you're selling yourself a little short by calling yourself like (laughs) a normal, regular guy. Firstly, your photography is incredible. I mean, your images are absolutely stunning. You really capture the essence and beauty of a place. And I think you often even enhance it in the way that you sort of edit your photos as well. Like really beautiful imagery. One recently that I saw from your recent trip in Japan, which I was just like, it's such a simple composition of this little town, but you've just captured it so beautifully. But also I was reading your blog and there was this one post about your, yeah, my 20 favorite experiences ever. And yeah. I'm flicking through that and it's just wild. There's nothing normal about that. That's just, <laughs> and you mentioned that you're 29 and yeah. this is all sub 30 stuff. So you make me feel a little bit insecure about my own accomplishments in this blog post. I've got to tell you. <laughs> okay. Well, now that you talk about the 20, my 20 favorite experiences, it's been, it's been over quite a long time. Like I started traveling like solo, if you can say that, when I was 19 years old. So I've been traveling like on off for the past 10 years. And before that, I was I was used to traveling ever since I was like a child. My parents took me on trips like five, six times a year sometimes. And I think that's when my like when my travel bug really started, if you can say that. So like some of these experiences have been like so many years ago. It's been over like a long period of time still. Yeah, I think, yeah, you're right. I guess it's a culmination of a lot of experiences that have happened Mm. over a long period of time but when you read them all together in a blog post it feels so incredible like honestly i don't even remember like the 20 experiences that i mentioned because it's been such a long time ago that i actually updated my blog yeah but you are a great storyteller and i think that you you've got a really great way of mixing words with the images that you capture but yeah sort of to go back to that point about you know you being 29 and and you having achieved all of this But also you you mentioned that you got this travel bug from a really young age. You mentioned that in in a bit of an introduction that you emailed me. And it's pretty normal, right, for a lot of Europeans to to sort of grow up having access to lots of different travel experiences because of all the different countries that you're so close to. But I mean, what was it specifically? Who who in your family was kind of driving that adventurous spirit? I guess it's been like both of my parents, actually. And I think it comes down to the fact that they wanted to give my sister and I like the best possible childhood. They wanted to create memories with us and like have great experiences and like, I think they wanted us to be able to tell, like, stories when we got back to school, like, with our friends. And lots of the time, they took us out of school, actually, to go on those smaller trips, like, just for a week or two. 
Um, but every time they did that, my teachers made me write kind of a diary about the things that I did. And like when all, all the other kids, they had assignments back in school, this was like my kind of assignment. So like every time I came back, even when, when I was just like seven, eight years old, they made me write like one page per day. So it was kind of a, a short story that I then had to tell all of my friends when I came back home um, and read in front of the class. Yeah. Yeah. I did ask you actually after you emailed me back a little bit of a story on your on your background and there's a few things that i want to touch on in sure. that because you're just such a great storyteller i've really enjoyed reading what you write and what you've written to me and one of the things that i did with you was i asked you who it is in your life that you sort of you looked up to growing up and you said that it was going to be a boring answer um yeah. and you, you named your parents yeah. as two people and your sister and, yeah. and you, you mentioned that she's really incredibly strong and we we can touch on that in a little bit but sure uh, yeah, I think you're very humble. That's kind of what I'm getting at here because you describe yourself as a normal guy. You think that, you know, looking up to your parents is kind of boring and your sister is kind of boring. But I think there's just, it's so simple, but it's like, it's so beautiful at the same time. And actually, when I thought about it, there isn't anyone that you would rather look up to than the people in your family, I think. That's such yeah. a really great place to be in, in your life. Yeah, that's like that's kind of the feeling that like I've had for my entire life. Like the only two people that I never wanted to disappoint was my parents. Like even from a young age, I had a great respect for my parents, like for all of the things that they did, not just for me, but also because I, I saw how they treated people around them and how they treated like my friends, my sister's friends, whenever they came around. And also just for like all of the experiences that they gave me as a child, because as long as I remember, they always put my sister and I in the first place. And I think that's a very beautiful thing. And when I look back, it's, yeah, I've never wanted to disappoint them. Like the things that I focus on is to make my parents happy and make them proud of me. So like that's how I felt from a young age. And whenever like I was in maybe a bad environment as a kid around the wrong people, I always thought of my parents and I thought if I act like this, that's not gonna make my parents proud of me. Like mm -hmm. they're gonna be disappointed. And I think that because of that, I've also made like lots of the choices that I have. Yeah, I really love that. You know, I've been seeing a lot of things lately um, from all different kind of angles around traditional values. And I think uh, a healthy respect and admiration for your parents is yeah. such a tra I think that's the right traditional word. value. Yeah, 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 it is. You, you do have a very healthy admiration and respect mm -hmm. for your parents that ob obviously you've had for a very long time. Yeah. And... Yeah. I think one of the things that we're grappling with a, a little bit as a society these days is kind of which are the the traditional values we hold on to or and which ones we let go because obviously there's traditional values in society that no longer serve us. Yeah. But I think when when it comes to things like you know the the respect and the admiration that you have for your parents not wanting to disappoint them, not wanting to let them down, wanting to make good choices um to make them proud of you. I think that's something that we don't hear enough these days from people. I'm not sure. What do you think? Yeah, I think you're completely right. And especially in my type of job, I see a lot of kids that are not well behaved, that maybe don't have the same respect for their parents as I did. Just when I walk around the streets um, back home, like I see that kids today are much more disrespectful. I think to the elders, if you can say that, than they were back when I was a kid. And I think that for a lot of kids it's more about what their friends think of them than the way that their parents have raised them and what they what their parents might think of their choices in life it's about the way that that society looks at you maybe but the way that your close circle sees you if you know mm. what i mean yeah you're like your peer group like that whole peer mm. pressure thing exactly that people talk about yeah yeah so i mean getting to that and, and then starting from the beginning of your journey, you know, you mentioned that your parents always took you on a lot of trips mm -hmm. growing up and that, that was sort of your major catalyst for wanting to sort of explore the world even more. I yeah. think your teachers also did something really profound for you as well in making you write those diaries. Yeah. Because I can imagine that with having the the pressure of having to write those diaries and make sure that you get those back to school as a, a way to make up for missing those school days. Yeah that 
it actually probably made you have to be more present and aware of your journey, like, you know, of the things yeah. that you better write down. It's funny that you mentioned that because like last year before I was embarking on a, one of my bigger trips, I met my, like the exact teacher that made me write those diaries. And I hadn't seen him for like maybe 10 years or something because he stopped as a teacher in my school when I was a kid. And we were just like chatting and he asked me, so what are, what are you up to now? Why are you not at work because it was like 10 11 in the morning and i told him it was because that i was going to india in a few days so i had the week off and like he just started asking me about all those trips and all the my pictures and my kind of work that i'm doing when i, when I travel and like somehow i could see how he just completely lit up uh, and his wife was standing like a few meters down the road just standing there patiently waiting for him like he didn't see her at all he was just so soaked up in the stories that i was telling him it was it was kind of a fun moment because i i felt like he was somehow proud of the fact that i was actually yeah. pursuing those dreams that maybe he could see already back then that i had yeah you know that's really touching i think i just got goosebumps there when you explained that <laughs> yeah. because you know, it, it's just kind of reminds me of the profound impact that teachers can have mm. in our lives. And I think for, what was your teacher's name? What was his name? Martin, Martin Kleehoop. He, uh -huh. he was my... Uh, Martin Kleehoop. Yeah, he was my Danish language teacher back in the primary school days. Right. So Martin, right. So the beautiful thing for Martin is that he's got to see you growing up as a kid. He's encouraged you to write these diaries as a way of making up for missing those school days. Mm. He's obviously enjoyed reading them. And now all these years later, he's bumped into you in the street and he gets to, ex he gets to almost still feel connected to that firsthand experience that he had, you know, with you as a child. Yeah. Of, that's just so cool. Yeah. It's just such a wonderful thing for a teacher to be able to uh, it, it was a really cool moment and afterwards we also connected on facebook so i hope mm. that he still follows along whenever i post on facebook even though i'm very bad at posting there <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think it's great for you to have someone that's known you for so long and, and has been able to sort of be part of that journey and watched you evolve from just a child who was going on a family holidays to this now yeah but can i ask you a quick question as well are sure. you a professional photographer you know how is it that you're able to sustain this lifestyle um, I wouldn't call myself a professional, but I also wouldn't call it just a hobby. I guess it's, it's something in between. Okay. So the way that I've been able to sustain it is that I've been working a lot as a teacher back home. Like whenever I've been back home, I've tried not spending like any unnecessary money. And like that's meant not buying new clothes for like years, spending as little money as food as possible. Um, and then I've just taken that money and like planned a trip. So like the last couple of years, I've been trying to get more photography deals, collaborations, if you can say that, whether that's mm -hmm. staying in hotels for free in return of photos and Instagram stories. It's just like product photography, but it's also something that I've realized I have to be like completely 100% in it in order to create the best possible photos because like just getting something for free even though it saves me a lot of money it might not do anything mm. to me on a personal level for example with the hotel photography i just came back from a trip to bali and i had quite a few collaborations but i just wasn't in it and i think that even though it saved me a lot of money and i stayed at some very cool places it's not fair to the hotels that i stayed in that i wasn't able to create mm. the photos that i had actually set out to achieve yeah so that's an interesting kind of fork in the road i guess you would call it yeah. for your journey as a as a photographer as well so you've got your day life where you're a teacher mm. and you save as much as possible which is great and i guess in order to help take this part of your life to that next level you've realized that these collaborations are a way of keeping that mm. up but I, I love how you just kind of explain that you feel like you need to be fully into it not just to get the most out of that trip for yourself but also to give back to the people that are sort of giving you yeah. that opportunity to stay in the hotel i think that's very ethical of you so we took a little detour there because i kind of uh, I just was fascinated with like, you know, at what level are you? It's not professional. How are you sustaining this? I just needed to get that off my mind. Of but I did want to go back because in the original write-up that you sent me as well, you know, you were at school, you're always planning, you know, looking at maps and planning mm. trips. And then when you left school, you decided that you wanted to maybe join the armies. Yeah, it was, it was actually during my second last year in school. I was 17 years old at the time. And normally when you're 18 years old in Denmark, you have to go to the 
I don't know what they call it, army day, I think. But I applied a year in advance because I thought that going to the army and joining the, the Queen's ship was a way for me to be able to see the world. And the thing mm. is that like, I hate mm. being on the sea, but I still wanted to join the Queen's ship because I knew it was sailing around the world, like going to those awesome places. And I wanted to be part of that. So I didn't join, I didn't want to join the army to like protect my country or what you might say. I wanted to join the army so that I could be able to sail around the world. Enjoying the episode so far? Be sure to follow us and leave us a review on whichever podcast platform you're listening on. Thanks and enjoy the rest of the episode. I feel like it's probably a good thing that you didn't end up joining the army in, in some I think way. So as well. But also, like we've discovered so far, and, and we're only just at the beginning of our conversation together, you could say, and what the audience has probably heard from you so far is that you're someone that's you know has really strong traditional values or really great traditional mm -hmm. values and is very ethical. And I guess you could say that you only really want to do the things that your heart yeah. is invested in. And so if you managed to get into the army, do you think you would have lasted long? Or I, th I think I would have lasted long just because I'm such a stubborn person. And if I set out to do something, then like I'm going to do it. I want to be the last person that quits. Like I'm a, I don't know. I'm, I'm the worst loser that I know. I hate losing. And I think that if I wouldn't have been able to last, it would have felt like a defeat. I really want to explore that. Actually, like I said, I'm always doing research and coming across really great, interesting, motivational people and quotes and things like that. And I think one of the things that I've been um, seeing a lot lately is that sort of notion of do the things that you hate to yeah. do, even if you hate them, like they're making you a better person. Like that discipline is really driving mm. you. Do you think that, I don't know, like that whole notion of you being a sore loser, I love the way that you phrase that, by the way. Do you think that's an asset of yours or do you think it's something that really detracts from your experience sometimes? I think it can be like both things really. Um, for example, when I'm back home, I'm never involved in any kind of family games, like card games, board games. I don't want to participate because I know that I'm going to be in a bad mood if I lose. But at the same time, while traveling, I've been hiking quite a lot. And I think in those situations, it's an asset because it allows me to like keep going even when I want to quit even when I want to to stop what I'm doing sit down take a nap stop for the night I still continue going until I reach the the goal mm. yeah that's that's really interesting that you mentioned that you know that it can be an asset the stubbornness is one of those things that's looked upon in a kind of negative yeah. light but I think well hang on and I was talking to my daughter about this Mm -hmm. recently i was saying to her something like this find out all of the true things about yourself be super honest with yourself about the things that you're really yeah. good at and the things that you're really bad at and, and what some of your weaknesses might be and if it's for example stubbornness then learn how to use that stubbornness in a yeah. positive way and i think yeah that's one of my key takeaways yeah it, a lot of the time it's about improving your weaknesses as you say finding out a way to make them work for you because we all have weaknesses yeah. nobody's perfect but yeah it's about finding out how to make those weaknesses work the way that you want them to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i love that i'm going to switch it up a little bit here actually um, and, and i'm going to continue on the path of the things that you mm -hmm. wrote to me as well and so you're 19, you booked a trip, Ecuador, Galapagos, then you went for a three-month trip through Venezuela, yeah. which is my home country, which I'm just more and more curious and fascinated yeah. about, I guess, it's amazing. these days. And that was 10 years yeah. ago. So that was when you were 19. What does that make it? Um, 2013. So you went traveling through Venezuela in 2013, 14. 14. And it feels as though it would have been a pretty hairy time yeah. to maybe be traveling through It was through just there. when things were starting to deteriorate. I think that Chavez died in 13, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah, I was, I was traveling around Venezuela with uh, a group of Danish people. We had um, two or three guides with us from Venezuela, but it was like really protected. And they had set like boundaries, I guess you can say, for like places we could go, places we were not allowed to go, things that we could mm -hmm. do and couldn't do. But still, I, I wanted to explore around this. And I actually ended up getting one of the people mm. fired because he put his trust in me and yeah, I, I broke it somehow. He, he got his job back afterwards oh, wow. after some explaining, but yeah, it sucked in the moment. Yeah. yeah wow. Okay. <laughs> Shit. Yeah. 
Okay, so you're going to Venezuela at a pretty dubious time. I guess there's a bit of that stubbornness. Maybe you'd planned that trip earlier and you yeah. didn't want to cancel it. But is it a, a mission of yours to sort of go as far and as wide as you can in the world? Are you sort of trying to tick these boxes or maybe down another route? Are you trying to go to the most interesting, dangerous places you can go to? Yeah. Like, what is it that sort of drives I your I think it's more like um, the last thing you said, wanting to go to the most inter interesting parts of the world. Because I like I remember making the decision to go to Venezuela. And like, to be honest, it had nothing to do with the country. I was just reading about things to do in each country that I wanted to visit. And there just seemed to be like so many opportunities for adventure in Venezuela, like waterfalls, river rafting, going into the jungle, staying mm. with the real cowboys, as they called them, like hunting for anacondas, crocodiles mm. and stuff like that. So it just appealed to me and like it appealed to my sense of adventure. And I honestly, mm. I, I didn't even look at the country and think that it was maybe dangerous to go at the time. I just thought... This sounds awesome and that's like it's something that i want to do yeah and so i guess that's kind of been one of the main catalysts that kind of decision making process has been what you've taken into other experiences Definitely, since yeah. then yeah it's about like especially now um, i have a kind of a different approach to it because back then it was just about doing the most awesome things where today I look at the places where I might be able to get the best possible photos and at the same time have like an, an awesome experience and meet some cool people. But I also want that real awesome. sense of adventure and that, that real travel feeling. Mm. And I don't want it to be too easy to, to visit the places that I'm going. Yeah, I'm just flicking through some of your photos as you talk and I'm just like, you do happen to just capture that sense of wonder really well. well. There's a mystery about it's your It's a lot about being at the right place at the right time and yeah, then just devoting the time to take the photos, I guess. Yeah, you know, it's a saying that I heard for a long time since I was, you know, a teenager and it goes, you make your yeah. own luck. It took me a long time in life to, to really understand what yeah. that meant. And I think if you claim to be lucky, then no one makes their own luck more than you. Yeah, I, I guess, especially yeah. in, in regard to photos, it's, it's about devoting the time because the more time you spend at a certain destination, the more, like the bigger the possibility of getting the photos that you want. And actually, I like the phrase that mm. Andrew said in, like during your first podcast, I don't remember it entirely, but it was something about if you want to be able to throw the strike, you have to show up every day and not just once a week. It was something like that. It's the same in photography, uh -huh. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to be there daily yeah. and practice daily and keep showing up. Yeah. That's so important. Even for me with the yeah. podcast here. Yeah. It's about showing up on the difficult days. Yeah. It's funny because I really love this. I really love what I yeah. do with this podcast. And I don't think that I've had any difficult days okay. with it. Is that the same with you in the photography? Uh, I've, I've definitely had difficult days, I would say. Like, especially one trip that comes to mind, it was just, it was not just a difficult day. It was like difficult weeks, but it, it was also down to my own mm. bad decisions, I guess, somehow. I was going to, well, I planned to go to Indonesia last year. And I think it was actually the day before I was supposed to leave for Indonesia. They closed the country for Danish citizens mm. due to the COVID numbers in the country. So I just booked the trip to India instead. But the day that I arrived, the numbers completely exploded. I was supposed to be in lockdown every weekend. I was in lockdown for the entire, like for the first seven days of my trip there. And like I planned to just travel around the north of the country taking awesome photos. It was just bad. I was able to go out for maybe 12 days over the course of a month. And then the day before I was supposed to leave for Denmark, like I had to get the COVID test. And of course it came back positive. So I had to stay in this hotel room for seven days, mold on the walls and the worst food ever. At the same time, my visa expired. I wasn't able to get it, get any help from the Danish embassy. And like I was reading a lot online and apparently after your visa expires in India, if you're still there, you're seen as an illegal immigrant. So I was just in this hotel room and panicking because I didn't know what to do. And yeah, that was, a, that was not just one difficult day. It was a difficult month. Yeah. You've chosen this interesting life though, haven't you? It's, it's, um, 
you know, I think the adventurer's life, a life that you've sort of been groomed into by your parents and sort of continued on that legacy, it's just, I look at people like you and I'm just, I'm in awe. I look at people like you and I'm just like, this person is incredible. They just have such a a love for the world and they do whatever it takes to fulfill that love and that's the side i see and that's the side that is often showed often i don't show the bad stuff as much as i want to and it's difficult to find the right line between showing the things that you want to show and then showing all the stuff that's happening around you but i'm not complaining about the lifestyle that i've chosen like i wouldn't have it any other way and i think if i could go back and make some different choices i would choose the same path 100 percent yeah Andrew started to bring it up in the last episode we recorded together um, after he came back from India. We started to talk a little bit about those, showing those bad sides of it. And he's kind of torn about it because he wants to show that, but he doesn't, it doesn't sort of sit well with some of his existing followers he mentioned. And so I'm curious to know how you think that we can continue on with this social media lifestyles showing only yeah. the good stuff because you seem very ethical and you seem like you've got like i said really great traditional values is there an opportunity for us to mix in some of the good with the bad and show you know what's yeah. real or do you think that that should have its I, own i think it should place? definitely be mixed together one example i can use is i just came back from a two-month trip and um, like normally i like to travel alone but this time i brought a friend and we started out in, in India and we had planned to stay in some nice hotels, nice areas. And so he only had Instagram basically as his reference to how India was. But he was absolutely taken aback because of the way that people lived, the way that the streets looked, how the living conditions were. Just the water running around the cities, it's completely black and filled with dirt. All the poverty and seeing people back in the streets and seeing small kids run around with babies on their arms asking for money. Like he knew that India was poor in regard to Denmark and in regard to a lot of other countries. But he had no idea what to expect when he actually stepped foot in India. And that made his experience of the country bad. And again, you only see the good stuff on Instagram because that's what people want to see. Yeah, well, there's two sides of that, right? Because, you know, Facebook, it's well known that they have cleaners in the Philippines that will get rid of anything that they feel to be unsavory. And a lot of it really is not fit for general public eyes, some of the stuff that they get rid of. So there's that layer of filtering that happens on that level. And then there's the curation that we do on on top of that, which is to show like the sexy stuff. And so I guess it's interesting that you mentioned that your friends had this experience. It's like an augmented reality experience. It's like you've picked up the brochure. You've found the most beautiful pictures that you can. You've gone, oh, yeah, I want to go there. You paid for the flight. You get there, yeah. and it's completely different to yeah, and reality. I, I, like, to be honest, I also think that a lot of his reference was um, because of what I've told him about the country. Because for me at the time, I've, mm. like, India was is my favorite country in the world because it's so it's so raw. Like, mm. it's it's real. So, yeah, it's it's um, it was very interesting to see his reaction when he got there because already from delhi airport yeah. to the hotel he was complaining so much like he just had the worst yeah. introduction to the country and i guess it's because of the way that i talked about it and from what he had seen on instagram and, and facebook and stuff yeah i guess that's really another interesting point because you go to india and you see the raw mm. stuff as something that's really valuable and beautiful and real and you really value that so yeah that's an interesting point that you raise because it, you, you almost need to ask yourself like what is it that i value these days what are the experiences that i can handle yeah. that i value and be honest with yourself about that exactly. before you go somewhere it's it's difficult because like social media has such great power over people and i think that we are all obliged to somehow make it a better place and i know that i as yeah. A single person is not able to do a lot, but if I can change just the way that one person sees things, then I think that I've also succeeded in that regard. And yeah, that's why it's mm. also important to remember to show the bad stuff. 
And that's one of the reasons that I love India, because you see all of the poverty, all of the people living side by side, the crazy traffic. But when you look at the people, they're so hardworking. And when you actually get to talk to the people, it could just be the man selling tea on the streets. They're so happy, even though they have so little compared to what we have at home. Most of the time when you just want to go for a tea, you can like you get it for free. Even though this man's selling the tea, he needs the money, but he's happy just to put a smile on your face, to see you happy to to sit down and have the conversation. And for me that's the beauty of like traveling around India. And I guess that's one of the reasons that I keep going back. Mm. You've been there four times. Yeah, four times. I mean, I mean, how does it feel when you got home? I mean, India keeps coming up again and again and again on this podcast um, for all different reasons. Yeah. And in the fourth episode, Gabby Lamb talked about, and I think she was there for, uh, it was at least a year. Um, she, oh, wow. Yeah, she talked about it as when she came home, she had reverse culture shock. Uh, okay. And I'm not sure if you know what that concept is of that concept of reverse yeah. culture shock. But to me, listening to the way that you talk about India and like the love that you have for the people there and the realness and the things that they obviously value, do you ever come home and you feel like a reverse culture shock of some sort? Uh, it it definitely gives me like a different appreciation of the things that I have. I actually had a very interesting experience. I think it was after my first time in India. I came straight back to Denmark afterwards. And for some reason, I wasn't able to sleep because it was so quiet at home. And my bed was, I guess it was too comfortable to sleep in because I'd been used to sleeping in, in hostel beds in the middle of the city with constant noise around. So I found myself having to turn on the television during the night to actually be able to sleep like just so i had that that sound yeah no, that's super yeah. interesting and you've traveled so much it's it's for me it's wild that you know after everything that you've done and all the places that you've been to that you talk about india it's just something that just keeps coming yeah. up what is it yeah it's uh it's funny because that's what that's what everybody asks me why india like why do you why do you keep going back when there's so many other countries but yeah, for me, there's like there's so much diversity in India. You have the mountains, you have the beach, you have forests, you have wildlife, amazing people, food. It's actually one of the few countries where I'm not alone when I walk around for sunrise because people are like at three, four in the morning to go about the daily business. And for me, one of the things that I like the most when I travel is to walk around the cities during sunrise. And it's it's just yeah, there's so much history, love. It's just a place that I can I can keep going back because there's so much to explore, so much beauty. And I think often that's what people, they forget a bit when they talk about India. Mm. You know, you're a special guy, I think, Nick. There's not many people I know that get up at sunrise to go walking around cities. And I want to dive into that with you a little bit. Uh, and while we've been, because this is our first time talking. And like I said, you know, yeah. I feel like I've known you for a little while now and I feel like I know you really well after reading your mm -hmm. writing and seeing a lot of your pictures and chatting back and forth through chat. But I've also learned that you're not very good at selling yourself as in like you're very humble. <laughs> you're, you're just extremely yeah. humble. So while we've got our listeners listening, just wanted to say that I read this part and this, this bit of your writing actually just like blew my mind. I was absolutely mind blown. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to read it out to people. I've done trips through Asia and South America, including four trips to India. I stood on top of the rainbow-colored mountains in Peru at an altitude of 5,200 meters to watch the sunrise, visited the seven wonders of the ancient world, slept beneath the Milky Way in the Sahara, swam with turtles and manta rays in Indonesia, and made my way through ancient villages in China. Yeah. I'm reading that out to the audience to give them context around like some of the breadth of your experience and that you, you know, just to make it, I guess stand out that you obviously keep coming back to India for a reason even though you, and you talk about it with such passion but yet you haven't mentioned any of these other things once <laughs> yeah yeah that's interesting <laughs> I, I haven't even I haven't even thought about those things during our conversation actually yeah and there's a re like there's a reason for that like w what are you learning about yourself and, and you're a teacher as well so yeah you know like what are you learning about yourself and are you finding that those things that you're picking up, are you passing them on to other people? Is this what's happening? Um, I don't think I am actually. No. Um, 
Uh, to be honest, I don't like to talk too much about myself. Even when my friends ask me when I get back home, like what I've done, it's just like the quick version. I've been to Indonesia and India and that was awesome. So I don't like to talk about myself too much i guess it's mostly with the kids when i'm working because like kids are so innocent and pure and they just they don't care what question they ask they just ask mm -hmm. like without thinking about it so i think in that regard it's it's easier for me to to actually talk about the experiences and the, the lessons that i learned than with friends and family mm. give me an example of one of the questions that the kids could ask make me <laughs> make me better a podcaster maybe well um there's a girl who just turned four years old and she asked me, why did you not get eaten by the sharks? Because I told them beforehand that I was going to swim with sharks in Indonesia. And so I said that I didn't actually get into the water because I got too seasick. And then we had a conversation about that. And why do I get seasick? And how, did, how, how does it feel to get seasick? Mm -hmm. and, and then she, she started asking what else I saw. Um, so yeah, for me, it's, it's easier to talk about those things when I'm actually asked about it. Mm. I don't know if it's, it's weird, but that's the way I've always been. Mm. No, I guess it's not weird. I mean, I meet a lot of very humble people. By the way, for everyone back at home listening, you did ask me, you know, if we could do this podcast together. So I figured that you'd want to, that you'd have a lot to talk about and you do, yeah. which is great. Um, yeah. But I think I, I really love that actually that, you know, you obviously have access to kids through your teaching and that you get to experience the beautiful ways in which their minds work and the questions yeah. that they ask and the naive innocence that they sort of, they show up with every day, right? Because they don't know yeah. anything yet. They're, they're relying on us to teach them. Yeah, exactly. And one of the things that I've been, I guess, thinking a lot about lately, and it's because of all this mindfulness stuff that I've been sort of getting involved in, is that is this notion that adults are just like kids in yeah. grown-up bodies, right? Yeah. And I find that that notion allows me to have more compassion for myself because I'm like, yeah. oh yeah, like I didn't want to grow up. I just grew up, you know, like that was it. I became an adult, yeah. but I still feel like a kid inside. Yeah. And, and I also think that that's one of the things that keep me continuing to like to travel because I want to have this feeling of just being able to do the things that I want to do. And it's funny because it's kind of the same feeling that I had during my summer holidays as a kid mm. i guess it's this feeling that i keep returning to mm. i just want to be happy and i want to be able to make the decisions that allow me to live the life that i want to because i think so often in life we care too much about the expectations of society and we care too much about what other people think but yeah i just try to keep having this same feeling that i had mm. as a child during my summer holidays Mm. Yeah, it's super interesting that you mentioned that we care a lot about what other people think. We become conditioned like that. But yeah, yeah, that, that little girl asking you those questions just kind of makes me smile because I think as, as grown-ups, somewhere along the line, we became afraid to ask these silly questions because we don't want to feel dumb yeah. or whatever. We care too much about what the other person thinks. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, look, so I mentioned just there about visiting the seven wonders of the world, sleeping under the Milky Way in the Sahara, swimming with the turtles. You've done so much. What are you looking forward to? What do you look forward to in your life in general now? Actually, I told myself when I came back home now that I was going to put traveling on a break for some time. Mm. And I think I felt like that for half a day because then I already started planning new trips. Um, I want to go to Pakistan to uh, explore the mountains. I was supposed to go two years ago in o October, I think, but it was just shortly after the Taliban went into Afghanistan. So it was a bit, it felt a bit insecure at the time. But yeah, I, I have a passion for the, like the mountains. And I think that some of the best photography for me is from the mountains. And Pakistan just seems like such a beautiful country in that regard. Mm. I want to go back to Kyrgyzstan travel around mm -hmm. go to the border area close to china camp and just explore the mountains and i want to go back to south america again venezuela for example i want to go to patagonia so yeah i have a lot of things on my mind that i try to make happen mm. and so i mean with your photography i'm curious to know where it's leading because yeah. you mentioned that you started with a point and shoot camera and that you'd been yeah. using that for quite some time and then i think your mom encouraged you to get a dslr 
Yeah. And so is the photography really evolving or is it just kind of, I don't know, it feels almost to me as something that enhances your travel experiences rather than the reason that you travel? Yeah. And I think that's the right way to put it. Like there's always things that I can improve, but I think that you're right because when I first started traveling, it was because I loved traveling. I loved exploring and meeting people, mm. having new experiences. And then I, I just brought a, a camera along that I'd been given by my parents. And I realized when I came back home that like my photos were actually quite good compared to some of the other people that joined the trip. Um, my my photos, and, if I was on that trip, my photos would have been one of the ones that sucked. <laughs> I've well, taken some really I, bad photos on trips. If you haven't already, find us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, or TikTok, where you can catch additional content and grace us with your thoughts. Thanks again and enjoy the rest of the episode. I, I think looking back, my photos also sucked, at least compared to, to what they look like today. But it wasn't until like a few years after that trip that I actually bought a DSLR that I could bring on my trip to Cape Town. But I looked at the, some photos from Cape Town and I thought, okay, I want to try to see if I can create something close to that. And then I just started studying by myself, forgot about studying to become a teacher and just focused on the photography part. But yeah, to get back to the question, I think there's always ways to improve and to evolve. But for now, I... I used to want to be like a professional photographer, but I think now I'm also happy to be able to return to my daily life. At least mm -hmm. that's what I feel like right now. A few months ago, it was a different story, but it's ever changing what I want. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, for me, it really feels like listening to you that, like I said earlier, like you've been, you've been groomed to be a traveler from a young age. Uh, I, yeah. And I can't, you know, listening, like reading your stories, listening to you talk, I can't imagine you sitting still for too long. That's what it feels no, like. No, it's, that's, sorry uh, to say that. yeah, that's, that's true. I thought I was going to do so, but I found myself like, I was already looking at a new trip for mid May, but yeah, it's difficult for me to stay in my daily life for yeah. too long. I guess it just becomes a bit too boring to do the same thing day in, day out. And I keep thinking about the experiences that I have had and the experiences that I could have tomorrow. Mm. Mm. Let's talk about your sister for a sec as well, too. You, sure. When I asked you about, you know, who you really like to look up to in life and to remind people it was your parents which is really amazing yeah. and then you also mentioned your sister she's suffered from cancer twice um yeah and never once complained openly about it i'm so glad i asked you that question because i just feel like you're just such a great man and you're so lucky to have these really wonderful strong characters in your life um, definitely and you know firstly how is your sister now and are you guys close? What part has she played in, in your life and your adventures in recent times? Yeah, so uh, my sister is good now. I think it's been two years ago she was cured for the second time. She had cancer for the first time when she was 12, I think, 12, 13 years old. So That's young. Like obviously that was, yeah, that was a difficult time for the family. And at least I always had that fear that like she could pass away because that's what you connect cancer with. So yeah, it was... A difficult time for all of us but i think that somehow it made it easier that she was so strong and she never complained even when she lost her hair and like obviously that's a like a very big thing for a 12 13 year old girl to do yeah she was so strong and she got through it and she was positive all the time and i remember the day that i found out my dad and my mom were at the hospital with my sister and they were asked by the doctors, I believe, if there was anybody else that had to be around. And they said that I was back home and so they were told to pick me up and come back. And obviously when my parents called me and told me that, I knew that something was wrong. And I just got, like, I got so angry. I started punching the wall, I remember, because I didn't understand why something like that had to happen to a person that close to me. So yeah, it was a difficult time and she got through it and she was positive and strong and mm. it was something that I really admired and of course still do because it, I cannot imagine how difficult it must be for a girl that age to mm. like get cancer, lose your hair, mm. like still go to school every day, spend time with your friends when she's not in the hospital and when she's not too fed up with the medication. That's something that I really admired a lot back then and still do. Yeah. 
Yeah. I think it, you know, through some of the things that you've explained to us today, it feels to me like you, you've been able to develop a real broad spectrum for the things that are really valuable and important in life. I think um, earlier, for no. example, that you mentioned that you, when your friend was sort of um, coming from Delhi airport through to the hotel, just landing in India, that there was just a lot of complaining. Yeah. And then in this piece that you wrote for me, you talked about your sister having cancer twice and never complaining once. Yeah. And so I feel like um, you have a really strong grasp of like um, the simple things that we should be grateful for in life. Yeah. I, I guess if you experience a situation like this, when someone close to you gets really sick, I think that you start to appreciate the smaller things more and appreciate the moments when you can actually spend time together when when she's feeling well and when like just when she's back home when she's not in the hospital and then slowly when she started feeling better again you see the the small developments and how she starts improving so it, yeah i guess you could be right in saying that but i guess many people feel the yeah. same way yeah, sure. For you, it's your normal, right? So it's hard for you to yeah. contextualize it like that. But I guess yeah. for me, outside, as an outsider looking in, you know, it's always easier for me to sort of go, go, wow, what strong qualities, what strong values, what great traits that this person has been able to acquire through these experiences. Um, and look, I'm guilty of it myself. You know, like there's people that say to me, oh, wow, you've done so much. And I'm like, really, I've, I don't feel like I've done much at all. <laughs> you know, like... Yeah, I, I feel the same way. Like mm. there's, there's so many so many more opportunities out there so many places to see experiences to have there's always something in front of you to achieve mm. you just have to grasp it mm. you also talked about um photography when you first started out it was jord hammond someone whose name i hadn't heard of before okay just thought i'd drop that in there uh, yeah like we spoke just then about like photography feeling like less and less like it was something that you needed to improve on um, yeah but, you know, is there someone that you sort of look up to? Maybe it's an adventurer now. Is there someone that you look up to like there's uh, like a, some crazy bucket list experience that you just go, wow. What what, what wows I, I, you, I, Nick? What what wows you these I, days? I guess in, uh, in regard to photography, it's still George Hammond. One thing is because of his style of editing. Like, I think it's it's so unique and there's a, a story behind every photo. And if you check him out on, on Instagram, you can see what I mean. His photography is just, it's some of the most stunning that I've seen. Also because he has a different take on popular destinations. He also visited those very popular destinations that many people want to visit, but he's he almost always manages to capture them in different ways from what you normally see online. And I think in the world of photography, that's something really special. Mm. I was trying to look him up just here on my computer <clears throat> while you were talking, but um, my keyboard's yeah. not working. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's, uh, he's really awesome. Such a good photographer. Yeah, I, I mean, and again, looking at your photos, it just it feels like he's... Yeah, when you talk about capturing things in a way that you don't normally see, I can see how that's kind of had an influence on you. Yeah. Especially this image at the very top of the Taj Mahal, I think. It's misty. It's, uh, yeah. you know, there's a crowd of very colorfully dressed people walking towards it. It's, it's not what you normally yeah. see. And, and it's, it's funny with that picture because um, it was not something... Like I, I walked in, into the Taj Mahal back then with an idea of what I wanted to capture. Yeah. Um, obviously I went to the most popular photo spots inside of the complex mm. and I think this is just one I, I randomly took on the way out like leaving the Taj Mahal mm. and like it wasn't a moment that I had planned which I normally do with my photography but for some reason it's one of my favorite photos I've ever taken. Mm. It's an excellent composition and I'm no photography connoisseur by any stretch of the imagination but for those of you who are listening, um, I'm obviously going to share Nick's Instagram handle here. I recommend you go on and check out this picture. Something about it, the lines, the proportions of it, the color, the mystery that the mm. mist adds to the image, um, yeah. the grandeur of the Taj Mahal sort of um, being able to still shine through or bounce through that mist uh, and still be prominent yeah. in the image but yet not the most important thing that you're looking at uh no for, for me it's the people yeah yeah it is and you can't see a face you can sort of see no. half a face 
it's, it's just a, the togetherness. It's just a special place. That's what it is. Yeah. That's what I can see here in this image. It's the togetherness that they have. Yeah. They're all walking in the same yeah, direction. All looking towards the Taj. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's, that's also one of the things that I feel grateful for because I've been able to visit four times now. And I think for many of those people, it's probably the first and only time that they're able to visit because they come from like a far... I met some people there during my, my last trip to India that came from south of India, like the furthest south that you can get. And for them, it was the first time actually visiting the complex and I was visiting for my fourth time. Yeah, right. So yeah, it's, I feel grateful also to be able to have those opportunities that I have. Yeah. And we connected a little while ago. It was a few weeks ago. You were in Japan. Talk to me a bit about that. I've always loved Japanese mm. culture. Yeah. Japan is just uh, it's special. It was my third time visiting now. And uh, for some reason, I keep visiting the same places. Like when I go to Japan, I don't, I don't go to new places. It's Tokyo and Mount Fuji and uh, the Fuji area, and then Kyoto. This time I didn't go to Kyoto, but uh, Japan is just, I don't know how to describe it except from special because it's, uh, I'm not a, a city person, but for me, Tokyo is one of the most beautiful places in the world. And just walking around, it's it's so clean. People are so friendly, mm. polite. It's one of my favorite cities in the entire world. Mm. You just have such a great way of um, of capturing images, and I think you got lucky. But I think um, I mean, I just want to go back to that point that you made. There's always you you were saying that there's always something more for us to do. There's always something for us to chase. There's yeah. always some way for us to improve. I was talking to Morgan in my last episode around about goal setting. I was telling her that I feel like I really suck at setting goals. And, you know, she had some really great words of advice around goal setting and why it's really important. And one of those is like, if you're striving for something, how are you going to be able to measure success if you don't have a goal to measure it off? And I was like, that's a really great point. But what actually she did yeah. is that she listened to the episode after I released it. And then she sent me a voice message and sort of changed her mind a little bit. She goes, actually, you know what? I feel like what I said about goals, I still believe to be true. But also, like sometimes it's good to not go into things in life with a goal in mind. I feel like yeah. at the moment in society, there's a lot of hustle culture and we seem to be perpetuating hustle culture just harder and harder, more goals. And I think she said something around the lines of something like that we still need to allow space for wonder in our lives. Yeah, uh, yeah that's a really, a really good way to say it. Yeah, I, I thought so too. She she speaks very, very well uh, and she says a lot of really amazing things, but I kind of tend to agree a little bit here. Yeah. And as much as I really admire you and admire everything that you've done, and I still haven't finished reading your blog and I'm going to, <laughs> um, and, and you're, you're not even 30 yet, which is wild. I mean, it kind of feels a little bit to me like, are you still chasing something? Or do you think you'll find mm. some satisfaction some, at some point? Are you able to look at yourself and go, you know what? I'm good. I'm ready now. I've done enough. Well, I, I, I think that if I would stop traveling today, I would be satisfied with the things that I've been able to see. But it's also a decision that I would regret for the rest of my life because um, like there's so many beautiful places in this world and I've just seen like a tiny, tiny bit. And like even the countries that I've been able to visit until now, there's still things that I want to experience in those mm. same countries. So I'm definitely not done. And there's like, without a doubt still places that I want to see. Mm. And to be honest, I don't feel like I'm going to be able to stop living this way anytime soon. Neither do I. I don't feel like that at <laughs> no. all. And, you know, Andrew and I were talking in the first episode about him and I needing to go to Venezuela and catch up there. And I feel like I need to do something the same with you. At some point, I'm going to need to yeah. meet you in person. I'm game for Venezuela. Yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, actually, I was talking to, I still have a friend in Venezuela. And so we talk almost on a daily basis. Wow. And I mentioned to him that I had two friends that would like to go and if, if he could help them out. And he said, yeah, without a doubt, because um, I don't know if it's getting more safe. I think so. Yeah, but it's also kind of, it's getting more easy to travel around the country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually spoke to my um 
I have a biological father that lives in Venezuela. In Venezuela. Still. Yeah. Okay. He lives on the north coast, yeah, on a beach called Trau. And uh, okay. I was very young when um, I came to Australia with my mum and my brother. Uh, my mum was set to marry an Australian man, and my and my real dad was left behind in Venezuela. Um, they okay. had a really difficult relationship, so mm. understandably, contact was kind of severed, and that was it. You know. It was the yeah. right thing at the time. But lately I've had this curiosity more and more. And I think because I only traveled for the first time last year, really late in life. I feel okay. like I prioritized so many of the wrong things growing up and finally got to a point in my late 30s where I was like, mate, you still haven't seen the world. This is wild. And it was while I was, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. No, I haven't. Yeah. A lot of people are shocked by that, but mm -hmm. I haven't. And... um yeah. Better late than never. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I agree. And it was while I was over there that I started to, well, I had time, you know, because I was, I was traveling. I wasn't sort yeah. of in my daily routine. I had time to think about, you know, that whole part of my life, this dad that I've got and wondering if this man's still alive, even not really even knowing. And so yeah. lo long story short is well, I was able to sort of have family over there track him down and we reconnected last year oh wow yeah 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 and, that's crazy yeah and he doesn't have a smartphone so okay he only messages me from friends phones and he uses whatsapp uh, so he'll have a friend with a smartphone that's got whatsapp on it and suddenly i'll just get this message yeah. on my phone from a plus five eight number and say hey you know it's your dad here you know so that's all, so cool yeah it's cool it's cool and um I spoke to him last week. I think it was maybe this time last week. He gave me a call and he, um, you know, I, I asked him a little bit about it. He goes, nah, nah, um, people are coming back because he, he kind of works with a lot of tourists. Um, he okay. makes food for and takes tourists fishing and stuff like that on this beach. And he said there's nice. heaps of people coming back and like heaps of French people coming back uh, at the moment mm. too. I am so, yeah, like I can yeah. confirm that it's getting safer there basically. That's yeah. awesome. That, that's one of the countries that I'm the most eager to revisit. Yeah, yeah. I, see, I haven't seen any pictures of yours from Venezuela. Maybe they're very deep. No, that that was back in 2014. I don't even think I, I have any pictures on Instagram. Yeah, right, from that far back. Yeah. But yeah, Nick, I mean, like it's, we could just keep talking, you know, I'm just really enjoying but, finally yeah. getting to know you. The same. But you know, it's obviously there's going to be more opportunities for us to catch up even on a personal level when we're not recording. But I guess this episode has really been about you and I just having a, a chat as two guys, as much as for our listeners to sort of get to know the perspective and understanding of someone yeah. who's sort of grown up with this travel life and, and you know you've had this itch that you've constantly needed to scratch and to maintain this life for a long time and you've had such wonderful experiences one of the things that you spoke about earlier that i want to revisit now just quickly is mm -hmm. that you are very good at saving money like you don't go shopping or buy things that are unnecessary in order to sustain or maintain yeah. this lifestyle in order to keep these travel experiences I feel like that's really important. Like, talk to me a little bit about that and maybe some of the other things that you do to be able to. What have you got down pat? That's what I want to know. That's what everyone wants to know. What, is, yeah. what have you got down to a T that allows you to continue to do this? Well, the most easy way for me to save was that I actually stayed at my parents' place until last year. Like in Denmark, it's normal to move out at quite a young age. But um, I knew since I was 17 years old that this is what I wanted to do, at least for the like, foreseeable future. So I was like, my parents allowed me to stay at home. Yeah. So I, I, I stayed at their house for like six months out of the year and then i was traveling for the rest of the time and uh, like obviously that allowed me to save a lot of money mm. because i didn't have the rent of an apartment as i have now and mm -hmm. um, i guess i missed out on a lot of things mm. as well because whenever my friends wanted to go party go to copenhagen have a night out most of the time i stayed at home because i had this goal of traveling around asia or traveling around south america and i knew that i needed to save as much money as possible in order to be able to do so it's something that I've started to do like a bit more in my older age, if you can say so. But like when I don't have those experiences with my friends, I have the same experiences abroad with new friends that I meet on the road. Because like when staying in hostels, as I do most of the time, then you cannot help but meet other people mm -hmm. to spend time with. Like you have to make the effort not to meet people if you want some alone time. Mm -hmm. So when traveling, I've 
just try to spend as little money as possible, like stay in hostels, take the bus or walk instead of taking taxis. Yeah. Um, when saving money this way, I think you get like a completely different experiences compared to like if you stay in hotels, take the taxi all the time because you see life in a completely different way because you are in the midst of it. Yeah. I just wrote the word sacrifice. Yeah. Because I think that really sums up, I guess that other side of it i think you've all yeah. obviously like we spoke about already that you've you know you've, your parents have sort of given you the travel bug early and that you've uh, yeah. been looking at the map and falling in love with places and you know saving but it's one of yeah. those things that i guess we don't really talk about a lot and what are the things that you sacrifice to get to do the things that you love yeah I don't, I don't see or hear people talking about sacrifice enough these days. Yeah, yeah there's, there's definitely some sacrifices and not just like my own privacy from like staying at their house, but it's also like, I don't get to see my friends for like half the year. I don't see my, my family for half the year, at least when I was traveling that hard as, as I used to. And it's about missing out on arrangements, parties, birthdays, family trips, trips with friends. It's a, uh, yeah, there's definitely a lot of sacrifices, but I'm still grateful for the fact that I've been able to stick with the choices that I wanted to take because like this is the, the lifestyle that I wanted to live. So I also knew that it came with like missing out on things. Yeah, for sure. What about relationships? You got, you got a girlfriend in your life or a partner of any sort? Mm, I had a girlfriend. Well, we didn't call ourselves girlfriend and, and boyfriend um, like last year. So complicated. Um, it, it's, yeah, it's always complicated. <laughs> um, but actually, I've, I've only had one girlfriend in Denmark. Otherwise, it tends to be relationships that I pick up on, on the road, which I've been unfortunately very good at. <laughs> and uh, the, the long distance relationships that take up a, a lot of the time while traveling, but also take up a lot of time when returning home. Mm. Uh, so it's, it's, it's mostly been abroad. But if I think about you versus someone who lives a more typical lifestyle, probably someone that you went to school with that yeah. finished school, got a job, got a girlfriend, got married or a boyfriend, got married, bought a house, maybe it's, goes on their <laughs> kids four week holidays yeah. every year to maybe Spain. Um, yeah. And yeah, I mean, not that I'm trying to compare lifestyles or that I think that one's better than another or anything like that. I think they're both different experiences, but we get to a point in life, I think, where we, sometimes we choose a path and we weren't necessarily aware at the time of making those choices of what we were yeah. potentially giving up. Yeah, and it's it's like um, now that you mentioned the relationship, it's it's not like I feel like I'm missing out on having a girlfriend. Like right now, I kind of knew that I had to give up that when I started traveling this much. At the same time, when when I met that girl last year, it was also someone that I wanted to spend time with and maybe wanted to put this kind of lifestyle on a hold with. But when it ended, I had the like completely same mentality once again that it's not that I. I go looking for someone and it, I don't feel like I need someone like that in my life, actually, because most of the time when, when traveling this way, I also get to meet a lot of cool people. And I think like having someone at home would not allow me to have those meetings, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I guess I'm more, more open-minded when I travel this way. Yeah. 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 And I've been thinking about it in terms of even this, this project, you know, like if I have a partner in my life, or maybe some of the ones that I've had in the past, would I be able to openly approach people and have some of the conversations, just conversations? I'm not even talking about anything yeah. beyond that. I'm talking about... Yeah, me too. Would I be able to have some of the conversations that I can have yeah. if I have that other person in my life? And I honestly think that the answer is kind of no, that there's an element of like, or oh, am I giving too much away of myself emotionally here to this person? And does that mean, yeah. does that make me feel like I'm kind of cheating a little bit emotionally on this person? Would I yeah. hold back from being that version of myself? I mean, yeah, I thought about that a lot lately, actually. It's funny that you mentioned that. Yeah, I, I think even on like an unconscious level, it would be something that I avoided, even though it wasn't like an active choice. But I think I would avoid like just having that conversation with a local woman on a bus, like just chatting. I think I would be more, I would be more interested in in talking to my girlfriend on the phone, for example, than yeah. than talking to the person next to me on a bus. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
it's something that I, I want to avoid also because obviously I, if I travel like for months during the year, I would miss my girlfriend mm. at home and I would miss out on things and eventually the relationship wouldn't be able to hold. Mm. And I would not want to make the choice between being with the person that I might want to be with or between doing the things that I want to do myself. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's um, it's really interesting because I'm of this kind of opinion that you're either open or you're closed. You can't choose to be yeah. open in some ways and closed in other ways. Does, does that make sense? And so just to give you yeah. some context around what I actually mean here is that let's just say that you're, you have a girlfriend back home and you're in Indonesia and you're avoiding talking to any of the local women. Yeah. That also impacts the way that you behave around the local men as well because you can't choose to have a closed energy here and an open energy there. It yeah. affects the way that you interact in the environment as a whole. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That, that's one of the things that I noticed. You know, since my relationship ended, for example, is that well, I've had to become more open as a person in general, uh, mm. and that's been beneficial to me in so many ways, including this conversation, yeah. um, because. It's forced me and it's allowed me to be more open in ways that I maybe don't think I would have been if I had this subconscious thing holding me back or, you know, am I crossing the line here? Should I talk to this girl? Mm. You know what I mean? So Yeah, yeah, and I, I think you're completely right because the relationship that you have back home would always be in the back of your mind. And it's you, like you cannot just put a person like that on hold, mm. uh, I guess you're going to say. Yeah. So, like, even when, when you're not talking, the person is still there. Yeah. At, at least I think that's how it would be for me. And I had kind of a relationship, I guess you can call it, two years ago, maybe, yeah. while I was traveling. And it also changed the way that I traveled back then. Mm. How? Uh, well, like, obviously, I missed the girl back home. Yeah, so you were on the phone. And I was more on the phone. I bought local SIM cards in, in the countries that I visited. I spent more time uh, in the hotel using the Wi-Fi than out wandering the streets. Mm. I guess I even took less photos because I was too tired during the morning because I was on the mm. phone during the evening. But it's like still, it's, it's not something that I regret mm. doing because I really enjoyed my time with her. Mm. But it's interesting to, when I think back to see my approach to travel was different mm. because of that. Yeah. Yeah. For, the, for my listeners, they're going to start to think that this is a podcast about relationships now that I've spoken <laughs> to Morgan in my last episode about yeah. it. But I actually think it's a really important thing to bring up with all of these different characters that I'm talking to on this podcast and like so many great stories that we're collectively sharing uh, and experiences and adventures and lifestyles and all of that. I think it's an important thing to, to talk about, A, the things that we sacrifice to do the things that we do. And then yeah. naturally, B, a part of that is like, okay, well, how do you manage relationships with the lifestyle that you have? I think it's starting mm -hmm. to become more and more of a question for me because, yeah. you know, we, we all need love. We all want love. Like we all Absolutely. feel the benefits of love and genuine connection with yeah. people. And I think that you have found a really great way of being able to supplement for that by, you know, making sure that you're open-minded and that you make friends in the places that you go to. Yeah. But it's an important thing to discuss. Uh, and at least that's what works for me. Like, uh, I, I guess it's different for everybody. And I guess some people are better than like better at not putting a relationship on hold, but better at enjoying the moments um, than I would be mm. in a relationship. Gee, man, uh, I mean, you're so wise already and uh, you're still so young. You're sub 30. You're turning 30 in August. What are your plans for your birthday? Have you got anything special planned? Any local celebrations yeah. back home? Um, actually, I'm going to be in uh, Bali again. Yeah, uh, because it's it's my it's my parents' twenty fifth anniversary in the same week that it's my birthday. Um, so yeah, we're gonna celebrate it in in Bali. Uh, my parents, myself, and my sister. So I have two weeks in Bali, and they want me to show them the most beautiful places mm. of the island. Yeah, that's gonna be an awesome trip. Mm. Yeah, awesome. And look, like I said earlier, we could keep talking and talking and talking forever. But you know, one of the things I want to <laughs> ask you is like, I know that you're still young, but what advice would you give to your younger self if you could give any advice to the to the 
to your younger self? What would it be? Uh, yeah, that's difficult. Um, to be honest, I don't know. Uh, I guess it would be to not listen too much what other people might think of the lifestyle that you want to live. Mm. To oh, maybe to to do the things that make you happy because we only have one life and I would not want to be stuck at home doing something that I don't love just for mm. a paycheck, but rather live a life that I love where I feel happiness like each day and just yeah, do the things that I want to do. Mm. That's such yeah, a I think that I think that when, when I'm happy, the people around me are also more happy. Yeah. Okay. You think about other people a lot, I've noticed as well. You know, you understand the impact. <laughs> yeah. You know, just uh, like yeah, you know, I don't meet many people like you, Nick, that sort of have this such a, a, a rudimentary understanding of some of these most basic principles and values that are just so obvious and, and that yeah that you you think should be just normal for everyone to have. But the, when I listen to you, I'm like, no, that's not normal. Not everyone speaks like that. <laughs> um, I, I guess, I guess it just comes back to the, to the way that I was raised yeah. really. Yeah. yeah. And I guess we should give, um, before we, we wrap up, I'll, I want to give a shout out to your parents and your sister as well. I know that they've had a big um, impact on you as a person and I just wanted to just let them know if they're listening that how lovely it was for me to read you write those things about them um, before you even came on here and said them. Um, and they yeah. they will never know that because they won't read that email that you wrote to me. <laughs> so I want to tell them. No, they written. probably won't. It was written in an email and um, I really I really admire that about you. But hey, Nick, I, I think um, you know we're a little bit over time. I just want to thank you so much. Was there anything else that we missed out on? Uh, well, there's countless stories that are still left to tell, but that, that would uh, that would take hours still. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I also would like to say that I appreciate the opportunity and the time that you've taken to spend this interview with me. And I really enjoy listening to your podcast. I think that you have a great way of expressing yourself and to make the people that you talk to like really dive into themselves and their feelings yeah yeah no thank you i really appreciate that it means a lot to me i have a lot of fun doing this i tell you and if it if doing this means that i get to speak to amazing people like you and everyone else that um that you just you have this way of life that i will never have you know i chose something different but yeah. just by connecting with you i feel connected to your experiences because of the way that you talk about them and that at least fills my cup up just a little bit you know to know hey i don't need to have done that but i know this person that's done that and the way that they talk about it is just incredible and that's enough for me so yeah i appreciate nice. that and for anyone that wants to catch you uh, i'm just going to share your instagram handle it's nicholas glued um so at nicholas glued that's n-i-c-l-a-s-g-l-u-d for delta and there's also you've also got a blog which i'm still making my way through is it's just I, I don't know if, I don't update it quite often enough. You know, but but it's timeless. I think your blog. Yeah. So you don't need it's not necessarily need doesn't need to be updated in my opinion. But if you want to get some of the some ideas around Nicholas's work and um his, some of his photography, um there's an ebook there apparently. Is there? What? I didn't see that yeah. before. Wow. Okay. Photography. Yeah. Yeah. About, a, about travel photography. Yeah. Wow. That's so cool. Check out nicholasglued.com with the same spelling that I uh, mentioned earlier for the Instagram handle. You'll find a link to that through his, his Instagram anyway. Nick, it's been such a pleasure to have you on the show. It's been awesome. I, re I really enjoyed it as well. It was, uh, it was so cool talking to you and o open up about some of the experiences that I don't get to do nearly enough. Well, we're going to need to do this again. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Awesome. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for listening and thank you, Nick. Thank you. We'd love to know what you thought of that episode of the Louis Diaz podcast. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and even TikTok to let us know. And be sure to follow, subscribe, and leave us a review on Spotify where you can catch some of our other really great episodes. Thanks for listening and catch you next time.